Hi folks, Paul Roberts here. In this video fishing journal, we're going to continue documenting seasonal change on our bass waters. However, as we near the, the spawn period here, my tact is to try and stave off the spawn for as long as possible. What I want to do is try and stay in the feeding binge period that I described in our last two journals. To do this, I try to take advantage of a simple, uh, okay, not always so simple, <laughs> generalization of nature. That small waters progress through their seasonal changes ahead of larger, deeper waters. Um, this is because more voluminous waters tend to take longer to gain and lose heat. So, my next move is to head for larger water bodies that remain slightly cooler. Now, things are happening fast uh, as our waters continue to march ahead acquiring heat. So a matter of days can make a difference as to exactly where in relation to the spawn the bass are um, um, in any given water body. But a thermometer with regular and judicious use can help, uh, tipping us off to the coming behavioral changes. But first, I need to give you a little history on the pond we'll be visiting. It's a large gravel quarry or strip pit. Uh, five years ago, catastrophic flooding, uh, described as a thousand year event, uh, hit, struck and impacted most of my bass waters here. Uh, some were essentially destroyed. Uh, real heartbreakers, those. The particular pond we'll visit in this video ended up with the trout stream that runs alongside of it jump its channel and plow right through the middle of the pond. <laughs> and it remained that way and closed to the public for four years. Just last summer, the stream was restored to its original channel. Um, I was involved in some of that work, uh, which was cathartic, I have to say. Um, it was really great rolling up my sleeves and helping put some of my home water uh, back together. The pond finally reopened to fishing uh, just this spring. Pre-flood, it was a pretty good bass fishery uh, and one that I knew quite well. But what's it like now that a trout stream has run through it through the, right through the middle of it for four years. From observations I was able to make while working there, I knew there were still bass in it. Uh, but what was it like limnologically and ecologically? What changes had taken place? Uh, and, and how did the bass fare, uh, the populations? I couldn't wait to get on and re-familiarize myself with the water. Post-flood, our pond is now 17 acres or so in size, um, having lost nearly a quarter of its area due to uh, the flood's deposits. Interestingly, it only lost about a foot or two in average depth, the majority now around 10 feet deep with a max of around, max of around 12 feet. It's a typical gravel pit, essentially dishpan contoured with a gravel and rubble substrate overlain by silt and muds from erosion over time, uh, mostly silts. The flood apparently adding about two feet of silt in places, um, as well as uh, much gravel and rubble in the form of bars. Uh, where the, the stream had poured in, ripped through it. Overall, there's very little cover in this water. Uh, never was, in fact. Uh, virtually no rooted aquatic vegetation, uh, and the brush and trees that were left behind following uh, the, the gravel mining operations decades ago have mostly rotted away. Some small stumps and now branchless, smallish trees remain here and there, scattered about. Um, shoreline cover, uh, so important in many small waters, is notably lacking in this pond. Uh, the main reason is the gradual slope of the immediate shoreline uh, that's just too shallow for mature fish of any sort, including bluegills. Uh, in fact, this is one of the few waters in my area in which bluegills are not the primary forage. Uh, the flood did, however, add some nice sunken woody debris that piled up in places. Um, nice additions those were. One side of the pond, though, has a steeper shoreline, and it's lined with overhanging trees and shrubs. Um, it's the shoreline every bass fisher would immediately head for. Um, it's just plain bassy looking. Uh, this shoreline does attract bass, of course, um, but pre-flood, some of the best bass fishing in the place were on away from shore humps and bars uh, surrounded by pretty much open water. Few of these spots are very exciting to look at, but it doesn't take all that much to attract object-oriented fishes like bass in such, you know, generally featureless uh, dishpan type waters. Only a couple of these spots, though, can be located by the naked eye, and even then only on a darn good sunny day. The rest must be located by sonar. 
The shoreline itself is essentially no help in reading underwater structure in this, this dishpan contoured pond. I chose this pond for this uh, fishing journal not only because I was excited to revisit it, uh, but also it fits our seasonal theme as it's a step up in water body size. Um, again, the idea being that I'd like to stay in the spring feeding binge period as long as possible. What follows the binge though is what I consider the actual pre-spawn, okay? Or what I call a preliminary spawn, meaning that preliminary spawning behaviors are beginning to show. One definition provided by observations by Rich Zaleski, uh, you may know him as Rich Z on the internet, um, in his book Advanced Bass Tactics, suggests that the true pre-spawn begins as bass move out of feeding areas and head for, start heading for spawning areas. In my small waters, such a movement or migration is short enough um, in distance, and the areas often being so close together, that it can be hard to separate this movement from feeding movements. Uh, but what appears to be telling is there is a behavioral shift, a shift in focus from one of food to one of spawning sites and other mature bass, uh, the social aspects of spawning. Uh, and this does appear to be related to or strongly influenced by water temperature changes. This journal involves three half days on the water over a span of a little more than a week's time. So I'm going to show you the contact with fish and spare you the interim pain. Uh, no reggae music to get us through this time. Uh, I won't leave the search out entirely. I mean, that's a big chunk of the fishing, right? So I'll share a bit about the areas I chose to concentrate my fishing time on um, and why. And I'll show the tackle choices I made, which are, of course, simple tools related to both the areas I chose to fish and the changing behavior or attitude of the bass as we all get squeezed into this preliminary spawn period. Again, temperature is one thing we can track. Our pond took on heat over the week with the depths um, at 10 feet rising from 50 to 54 over the week. Surface temperatures topped out each day at 58 to 59, so we're getting close. Um, but the mid-depth temperatures, what I tend to look at at this time, uh, were around 55, 56. This is working its way toward the apparent threshold temperature uh, of 58 degrees Fahrenheit at mid-depth, about four feet, that I've called out as the temperature that incites the onset of spawning activity. As far as water clarity goes, I was concerned, even expecting, that we'd have reduced clarity due to post-flood silt being rolled up uh, by the winds. Uh, the main cause of the destruction of some of my other uh, flood impacted waters here. But I was surprised and quite pleased to find the water not too much different than it was pre-flood with a good five to six feet of clarity. Such high clarity and cover free water often calls for finesse gear. So I adjusted um, adding in a couple of finesse rigs. Uh, and, and because we're sliding into the true pre-spawn uh, when the bass would be becoming spawn minded I also threw in some stickworm tackle, uh, just deadly for the ratcheted down attitude of peri-spawn bass uh, that um, are beginning to cruise spawning areas. On the water, I started by re-familiarizing myself with the place by exploring previously known structure. Uh, I found no bass off the big um, open water bars, and in fact I found no bass in open water at all. Uh, not that there were no bass relating um, to those uh, open water bars, but uh, to give them a fair shake, really, I needed marker buoys with me to be more precise. Uh, the bars having uh, been changed drastically in shape uh, from the flooding. Uh, but I, I didn't bring them. <laughs> uh, what I did find out there, there uh, were trout. Uh, remember, a trout stream had run through the middle of this pond for the last four years. It's actually possible that the trout, uh, predaceous and fast-growing browns, they were decent sized, uh, may dominate the open water outcompeting the bass for open water prey. If this is the case, it's likely that those tables will turn when things warm up come summer. Uh, the bass taking the upper hand out there at that time. Uh, remains to be seen. After checking out those open water areas and essentially striking out, uh, on bass anyway, uh, I then started looking for other available structure and cover. Uh, I did find a large pile of woody flood debris, um, and that held fish. Um, that was a, an awesome find. Uh, I also refound a previously known flat or, or protruding shelf uh, with some rock on it, 
and some good spawning substrate along its shoreline. Interestingly, it still appeared much as I remembered it uh, prior to the flood. What was missing, though, were important uh, spots on the spot. Uh, drowned shrubbery and root masses that had apparently uh, rotted away or silted in. Uh, but it still held fish. I also fished the more obvious, uh, more bassy looking steep shore with overhanging trees and, and some scattered woody debris through it. In terms of presentation, because of the flood, I didn't know what to expect exactly, uh, precisely what tackle to bring. Being in a float tube, my space is pretty limited, so it helps if my guesses are at least in the ballpark. Initially, I planned on aggressive feeding binge type presentations, um, jerks and cranks for the most part. The baits I ended up using, though shifted, uh, representing the behavioral shift I began to suspect was in play as water temperatures rose through the week. In short, my focus changed from aggressive binge techniques uh, toward the slower and more subtle preliminary spawn techniques. Uh, and, and my locational uh, focus shifted as well toward potential spawning banks. The bass and I were simply being railroaded toward the spawn, uh, uh, which was imminent. Um, in fact, the first beds are undoubtedly down as we speak. It was that close. Okay, that's pretty much the backstory, uh, the 2020 hindsight. Uh, let's fish, let's hit the water during the shift from the pre-spawn feeding binge period to the, what I call the preliminary spawn period, just prior to the actual spawn. Shallow in there. I'm bumping stuff. I'm going to be picking up algae. Yep. Push out a little deeper and then I'll put a, another bait up shallow. There's one. Whoa, I got hit hard too. Oh. <laughs> He's hooked on the belly. No wonder it fought so funny. He's able to stay down. All right, honey. Whoa. Did you see that? All right. Now I got one hook. One corner hook there. Uh, nope, no. Nope. On a gill plate. All right, come on. Don't, don't freak out, buddy. Gotcha. Oh yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And look how red those mouth is. All right, let's get those hooks out. Wow. All right. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. Look at that. Really small fins. Look how small the fins and the, the mouth. Look how tiny the mouth is. Huh. Fast grower? Sure looks like it. My word, that's a little mouth. <laughs> look at that. That is bizarre. And that those are very red teeth. All right. All right, good female. <laughs> mm 
wonder if I can pluck a scale from her. I'm just curious about that tiny little mouth. Hold on, honey. Right up here. There we go. All right, hon. All right, hon. There you go. Zumba. All right. There's some scales. See what I can pop them in a box or something. There's one off the end of the bar. Not a big fish. Oh, is it a brown trout? It's fighting like a trout. <laughs> it is a brown. Whoa! <laughs> kind of thought so. It was the rolling, that bullhead roll. All right, well, this is post-flood. The uh, trout stream ran through the middle of this. Whoa, that's a dangerous kind of thing. You're gonna roll, are you? All right, I guess we're gonna have to belly lift you. No, no, that's not gonna work either. All right, let's you tire out a little bit. That is not a bass. Different deal. Oh, man. that brown trout roll thing and you're too slippery to to grab I might oh man I might have to kick to shore with for you I'm gonna get a hook in me I'm going to shore this is this is a bad idea Tiny lipless. Whoa, I got pounded by a trout. Turn it. Turn it. That's what I get for putting something flashy on. I'm going to have to take him to shore. Oh, man. That was quite a leap. I don't think my camera caught it. You're going to roll, are you, honey? You look like a stream fish. Let's go to shore. Uh, that was a, quite a leap you made. I think my arm was in front of my camera, though. Tow you along. Rolling brown trout. All right, fella. There is a cartwheel. There's a fish. I got hit in that wood just, <laughs> just as my line got hung. Okay, honey. Okay, honey. Let's hold our position. Mm. Mm. 
All right, another dark, really dark, smallmouthed fish. Mm. Yeah, look how dark that fish is. And little tiny mouth and red. Hmm, very different looking. <clears throat> All right, hon. Oh, there's another one in that wood. Oh, but it's off. Darn it. I got railed. <laughs> All right, I found a few in here. Okay, I'm gonna switch to a fat plug. A little higher floater too. Wide and fat. Let's see about running this. It's a shallow runner. Let's just see about running this right through that brush pile. Bump. 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 Nobody? Whoa, my word, that was a trout. He's in the brush pile. Did you see that? That was a, that was so fast. That was so fast that had to be a trout. <laughs> that may have been a very large trout because that was a knifing fast strike and took me down inside the wood again. <laughs> that was musky fast. <laughs> Holy moly. In the wood and probably gone. Holy cow. All right, over the trees we go. That was insane. Holy moly, that was fast. There we go. Back to where I started. We'll see if I can drift out of here quietly. <laughs> all right, all right. I gotta lure that fish out of that wood pile. And what that means is I've got a fish from the side. I can't fish right over the top of it like that. <sighs> that was a big brown trout. Did you see that strike? Oh my word. That was, uh, the only way I can describe it is, is, and this is a very much a trout thing, is a knifing strike. It was, he saw it from a distance and came a-running. Um, a bass tends to want to try to get a little closer. Uh, they don't have that kind of speed. That was incredible. That was a lot bigger than the trout I caught earlier. Oh my word. So, uh, this shoreline is not going to be much interest to the bass at all. And the reason is, it's such a gradual uh, slope that it's just really shallow. It's a, a foot, foot and a half deep, quite a ways out, and it's silt bottomed. Um, that's not going to be of much interest to the bass. Uh, if, they, if they don't have any other place to spawn, they will come in and scour it out. But uh, there are other options to spawn here. There's a lot of cobble-bottomed areas, so um, my guess is this will be bypassed. 
Um, unless there's a huge population of bass here that are competing for spawning sites, but uh, that doesn't appear to be the case right now. Anyway, this is not a very interesting spot, even though the shoreline looks pretty cool from a distance. It's too shallow, too silted. We're going to move on. Got more gas coming up, and you can see there's a fairly firm bottom here, that yellow. Uh, I'm going to spin to the sun. So you can see, um, this is yellow in here, meaning it's fairly um, hard bottom. Uh, and uh, uh, we got gravel and rubble down there. And not as much silt. The blue is going to be the silt. Um, so hard bottom, uh, contour change, a shallow flat that is, has, has an edge to it, uh, is enough to attract fish. Okay, I'm up on that bar. There's some rocks on it. Um, I'm going to cast right in shallow. There's one. <sighs> I would like to kill this fish so I know what's in its stomach, but... Oh, don't soak my camera, please. To clean the lens, I didn't bring any lens stuff. All right, honey. I'll work you in here. I wish you'd been able to see that bit of back reeling. Show you how easy it is. You know who I am now, don't you, honey? There you are. All right. Oh, you've got a mark on you. Okay, you're another one of the real dark fish. Look at that. So, a couple black spots. I We don't have that black spot thing here in Colorado that I've seen before. Um, tiny mouth. 17-inch uh, fish, um, very red mouth and teeth. It's that dark, this is not that brilliant winter red that I tend to see. Um, I'm thinking this is a stress-related thing, although hard to tell if she's got food. Definitely got eggs. And there is a, f what looks like a fungal infection, and there is. Okay, there's algae growing in that infection right there. Yeah, there's a f infection right down to the bone there. All right, honey, let's pop that hook out. Spin you into the sun. Get a look at you and put you back. Oh, I'd like to know what's in your stomach. I really would. But I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. Science can wait. Beauty before science. <laughs> the heck is that on my sonar? Looks like... Mm -hmm. fish? Dense, uh... filamentous algae? Oh, bubbles coming up. Carp. Maybe feeding carp. There come the bubbles directly underneath me, unless my anchor's dragging and that's mud. Whoa, I got a fish underneath me. <laughs> Direct, that was a fish. And it's a bass. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Vertically jigged. All right. That was pretty cool. Hope we got to see that on sonar. OK, 
Come here, little, little fella. All right, pretty thing. All right. And you've been caught. You've been caught, buddy, right there. Hmm. Little tiny mouth on you. Look at that little tiny mouth and 14 inch body. 14 and a little better. Tch. Hmm. And you've got food in you. Wonder what you're eating. There you go, fella. There's one. <laughs> Same exact location. Unless I follow the carp. <laughs> Don't think so. Mm hmm. Come on. Come on. All right, I haven't seen you yet. Oh yeah. About a 15 inch female. There's a U. <laughs> All right. You can go, honey. There's one. Wait. <laughs> Took pretty hard, too. Whew. Oops, sorry there. Blocking the action there. Let's back the drag off just a bit here. female. Mm -hmm. All right, come on, mama. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's a long fish. Okay, this one's, she's not quite as fat as some of the others, but she may go 20. She does not go 20. She is going to be about 18 and a half, 19. Yeah. When they first come out of the water. <laughs> Boy, look how little that mouth is. Look at that. What is the deal with you guys? Growth? Boy, there's some length on this fish, too. You know, we're going to have some big bass in this pond in a little while. If they're not here already. All right, hon, yep, the pour is getting extend distended. Yeah. You're not laying yet, are you? I doubt it. You shouldn't. But the surface is closed. No, that's no, that's just 
All right. Sorry, sweet pea. All right, man, look at the little mouth on you and the length. Wow, oh, how cool is that? There you go, honey. Mm-hmm. Finally get that hook to hook right. <laughs> look what it did to the weed guard. Man, I don't know if I like these little weed guards, these little wire guards. There's one. All right, just let me get a look at you, honey bear. Yeah, I actually said that. Ah, oh, you've taken it deep. I can feel those teeth rubbing against the line. Okay, settle down, hon. All right, that's a 19, maybe a 20 inch fish. This is what I need to know, what's going on with these fish. We're sliding into the true pre-spawn now. The binge is relaxing. Just a little red in the teeth there. Okay, you are Pushing 19. Good old stickworm. Getting it done in pre spawn. True pre spawn, that is. Oh, there's another one in that wood. Whoa, my work. <laughs>